way. I'd like to welcome everyone back to our class, The Sacrifice of Christ in the Old and New Testaments. Uh, we are just about to the end here. We're on week 12 of 13. Tonight we will be looking at the Epistle to the Hebrews. And as I said last week, the whole theme of the book is how Jesus is better, or how Christ is better. His priesthood, his sacrifice, his covenant or testament as it's called. Just everything about Christ was better than what was in the Old Testament. Because one, he was the perfect fulfillment of it all. And I'm sure we could look at even more scriptures than we're going to, but I have quite a bit I'd like to cover. So we'll begin in chapter 2. Uh, Hebrews chapter 2, and we'll begin in verse 14. I do have them here so you can follow along if you want. <laughs> or in case Brother Kenny closes your Bible on you. <laughs> Hebrews 2, chapter, or, chapter 2, verse 14 says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lives subject to bondage. For verily he took on him not the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to score them that are tempted. Verse 14 I've quoted, I think, multiple times already throughout the course. How that Christ through death says he defeated him that had the power of death, that is the devil. You know, I don't know exactly how much, what exactly this power of death that the devil has. Certainly he brought death upon the whole human race spiritually by tempting Eve and then them, Adam and Eve, falling to that sin. But I do know this that Christ says he now holds the keys of death and hell in Revelation 1 18. But through his death, he defeated the devil, or Satan, as we call him, Lucifer, whatever else you would like to name him. And it says, And deliver them through who fear of death were all their lives subject to bondage. You know, this the natural man is afraid of death. It's It seems to come naturally to him to be afraid that his flesh will die one day. But Christ came to deliver us not only from death itself, but even from the fear of death. For the child of God, we have no reason to fear death. For as I pointed out, I think last week, it is not the same for the child of God, it is for the wicked. But to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, is what Paul said to the Corinthians. Really, that fear <laughs> causes a lot of people to be in bondage, doesn't it? They spend their whole lives trying to escape death. They spend their hard-earned money to prolong their life as much as possible. And I'm not saying we shouldn't take care of ourselves. We shouldn't, you know, we should try to have good health. We should try to take care of this body as being good stewards of what God has given us. But yet, death should not cause us to fear. Death should not cause us to worry. Whether it comes to us at a young age or an old age. Really, Christ has defeated death for us. We might take our last breath in this flesh, but oh, we will have eternity with him. Amen. Verse 16 tells us that Christ didn't take on the nature of angels. But he says he took on him the seed of Abraham. He was Jewish, Hebrew, if you will. He was not a white man with... Sandy hair, I don't think. I also don't think he was a dark African either, but he was probably somewhere in between. Right. You know, he could have been as the angels were. He could have came, I guess, in any form he desired, but it was best that he came like his brethren, as it says here. 
It behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. So Christ was the perfect high priest. He really, he became just like us, that he might, as it says here, secure them that are tempted. That's to help us, to aid us, relieve us. So he was tempted just as we are, yet without sin, the scripture says. So we'll spend a bit of time looking about him as a high priest and Hopefully that'll make sense as we go through the book here. But that Christ is our great high priest is really a needed thing because the, the priests of the Old Testament, they could never wash away sin. Right. Let's go on to chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse 14 through 16. It says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that has passed in the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be tempted or touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly in the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Christ is our great high priest, and he is eternal. He is now at the right hand of God. It says here, passed into the heavens. But he's not one that can't be, as he said, or touched with the feelings of our infirmities. He's not one that can't be empathetic, if you will, to and sympathetic to our needs. For he really endured the same things that we endure. We know he was tempted of the devil in the wilderness. Probably no doubt in other times he was no doubt faced trials literally and figuratively at the, his arrest and crucifixion. There is really nothing that Christ or that we face that Christ doesn't understand. Yet in all things he was without sin. He was that perfect sacrifice. He was you know the perfect example if you will for us. And because of this he says let us Therefore, come boldly on the throne of grace. Because we have this great high priest that understands our needs and cares for us, as Peter says. He says, let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So Christ can help in whatever need we have. His grace is sufficient, as Paul told us. <laughs> well, certainly his mercy is far greater than our understanding. It was it Jeremiah that said, his mercies are new every morning? Amen. So we have this great high priest in Christ. I know we don't, I don't think Christians think about the priesthood as much as the Jews probably did. Or for the Jews, the priesthood was how they you know, atoned for their sins. That's how they made their sacrifice was through the priest. That's how they rolled their sins over for a year. Right. But Christ has done all this for us. <laughs> we don't have to go in yearly and make new sacrifices. The difference in the Christ is our great high priest. The, if he can give us grace. He can give us mercy. The priests of the Old Testament couldn't do that. They could, might could give godly advice and point you in the law what you should do but that's about as far as their help could go they could yeah. pray for you right. but we can pray to our great high priest Amen. let's go on to chapter 5 uh, look at start verse 1 here Paul you may believe it's someone else we can call him the writer but Paul here says for every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men and things pertaining to God that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way for that he himself also is compassed with infirmity and by reason hereof he ought as for the people also for himself to offer for sins and no man taketh this honor unto himself but he that is called of God as was Aaron so also Christ glorified not himself to make or to be made a high priest, but 
He that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. He says here that the high priests were ordained among men. Certainly they were. They were the Levites throughout the Old Testament, starting with Aaron and his sons. They, they offered, as they call it here, gifts and sacrifices or offerings and sacrifices for sins. And they also had offered for themselves because they were sinful people. They couldn't even offer on behalf of the people until they had taken care of their own sacrifices. Yet they could empathize with the people because they were in the same situation. But so can Christ because he came and dwelt among the wicked, yet without sin. There were some possibly that tried to make themselves a priest, but those were not the priests of God. God's priests were called of God, just as the preacher is called of God today. In verse 5 here, is quoting from, at least the end part here, is quoting from Psalms 2, verse 7. He says, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. Christ did not make himself a high priest, but he was made a high priest of God, it says. The Jehovah's Witnesses will try to use this verse to say, Here's when... Christ became the Son. He wasn't God before this. You know, I, I don't know if anyone is even completely sure what is meant here. I've studied it out. And some people point to the birth of Christ and that he was begotten physically when he was conceived in Mary. Paul quotes this in Acts chapter 30 or Acts chapter 13, verse 30 through 37. He references the resurrection of Christ in that passage. Well, some have pointed to say that it is referring to his resurrection as being a type of birth. But I do know, all I know for sure is that Christ was the Son of God from eternity past to eternity future. Right. Well, he certainly became God in the flesh at one point in history, but he was always God. Right. He be took on him the form of sinful flesh, yet without sin. And I believe he's still in some glorified form of a body today. Mm -hmm. But he didn't begin at conception in Mary's womb. Exactly. And we see him as far back as Daniel chapter 3 with the he three Hebrews in the fire. Right. I think we see him in Genesis coming to meet with Abraham. Uh, yes, and all the way back to chapter 1, God said, let us make man in our image. Right. You know, the Hebrew roots movement, as they call themselves, uh, they're, they're really Judaizers, they're Say you got to keep the law. They they begin by saying you got to keep the law. Then they be, go on to say the Holy Spirit is not God. And now that whole bunch has gone on to say Christ Himself was not God. You know, heresy always leads to more heresy. Anyway, we won't get off on a rabbit trail. Let's go on to verse six here. It says, "As he saith also in another place." This is from Psalms one ten verse four. It says, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. This Melchizedek is a mysterious person. In fact, he's only recorded in one place besides Psalms 110 in the Old Testament. We'll go over there in a minute. But Christ was not as the Aaron priest were, but he is as the Melchizedek priest he was not a Levite. We know he was of the tribe of Judah. Verse 7 says, Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications, this is referring to Christ, I believe, with strong cries and tears unto him that was able to save him from death, and was heard in that he feared. Though he were a son, yet he learned, it learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. You know, Christ, we know, cried out in the Garden of Gethsemane. If it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Uh, Matthew twenty six thirty eight even says he was exceedingly sorrowful even unto death. Right. 
but yet he learned obedience. He learned complete submission to God. But throughout his life, we see it, even in death, we see that he completely submitted himself to the will of God. That is what it means when he says he learned obedience by the which by the things which he suffered. You know, I I know the physical sufferings were bad enough, but the you know, the spiritual, if you will, were even worse. The separation from God the Father, I think what he dreaded the most. Yet even in that he learned to be obedient to God to his father as he's called and verse 9 says in being made perfect he became the author of eternal salvation unto all of them that obey him called of God and high priest at the order of Melchizedek so he was perfect as we see he was really perfect in his obedience and his sacrifice and everything that he did he says he became the author <coughs> that's literally the causer of eternal salvation unto them that obey him. So Christ is the the originator, if you will, of salvation. You compare that to Hebrews twelve two that says Jesus the author and finisher of our faith. So it all begins with Christ, doesn't it? Yet man wants to attribute that to himself. So Christ is the author of salvation, he's the author of faith. He is the one who makes us a new creature. It is not God. I mean, it's not man. It is God. <laughs> well, Junior, do you have a comment? Okay. Oh, sorry. I might have cut you off there. He does say unto all them that obey him. I don't think that means that we have to be perfectly obedient for salvation's sake, but yet we, we at the very least have to obey his call to repentance and faith. We should be obedient after the Lord saves us as well. Then verse 10, he reiterates the same as we did in Psalm verse 6, that Christ was a high priest at the order of Melchizedek. Let's go on to chapter 7 and look a little bit more about this Melchizedek. <laughs> verse 1 of chapter 7 says, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of kings and blessed him, whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. Stop there for a moment. Let's turn over to Genesis chapter 14. This is where Paul is referring to Genesis chapter 14, verses 14 through 20. Genesis 14, verse 14 says, When Abram had heard that his brother, here he's referring to Lot as his brother, was taken captive, that was by the the king in, uh, so back in verse 9, the king of Elam, down, they took Lot, in verse 12, Abram's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom and his gods, and departed. When Abram had heard his brother was taken captive, he armed his trained servants, born in his own house, 318, and pursued them unto Dan. And he divided himself against them, and he and his servants, by night, and smote them, and pursued them unto Hobah, which is on the left hand of Damascus. And he brought back all the goods, and all also brought again his brother Lot, and his goods, and the woman also, and the people. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Kedorlaomer, Omer, excuse me. And after the kings that were with him, and at at the valley of Sheve, <coughs> which is the king's dale, and Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the high priest, or he was the priest of the most high God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thine hand. And he gave him tithes of all. This is the only recording we have of Melchizedek here. So, 
But yet, Paul tells us even more about him in the next verses, as we'll see. But Melchizedek here means king of righteousness. This uh, Zedek means righteousness. We see it in other places. Adonai, Zedek, king of Jerusalem, is means the Lord of righteousness. Zedekiah means that Jehovah is righteousness. But here we have king of righteousness, who was the king of Salem. Salem is thought to be an earlier name for Jerusalem. Uh, Salem means peace. Jerusalem means city of peace, or literally teaching peace. If you look at the English and at the Hebrew, Salem is at the end of Jerusalem. We just don't pronounce it as Salem. And Psalm 76 verse 2 also seems to equate Salem with Jerusalem. But it says that Abram gave tithes or a tenth part unto Melchizedek who was the priest of the Most High God. There's only one Most High God and that is the one we call Jehovah. It says he was without father, verse 3, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth the priest continually. So we're not told where Melchizedek came from, where he went to. Some suppose that it was a manifestation of Christ himself in the Old Testament. He certainly was the perfect type of Christ in the Old Testament. Because he, Christ was without father and without mother, wasn't he? No, he, he had a fleshly mother, but she was not the mother of God. Right. And he was raised up in the house of Joseph, but he was not his father. Right. He had no descendants. He had no beginning of days, and he really had no end of life. Right. You know, Christ is from eternity past to eternity future. And he abides the priest forever now, a priest continually, as he says here. So, and notice verse number four as well. It says, Now consider how great this man was, even unto whom the patriarch Abram, or Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils. Well, I don't know. Abraham was highly esteemed among the Jews, but Christ was greater, wasn't he? John 8, 35, 8.53, I mean, the Jews said, Are you greater than our father Abraham? Well, Christ was greater than Abraham. He was, be before Abraham was, I am, he says. <laughs> well, I read one theory that Melchizedek was a descendant of Peleg. I, don't, I don't, can't find any scriptures that support that. I guess for now, Melchizedek will remain somewhat of a mystery to us. But certainly he was the perfect type of Christ and could have perhaps been even Christ himself. And right. Let's continue on here, though, in verse 5. Or no, excuse me, verse 11. I want to skip down a little bit. It says, If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it, the people received the law. What further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? And he says basically if, if the Levitical priesthood or the Aaronic priesthood that sometimes referred to is, was perfect, if it brought perfection, then what need was there for another priesthood? But it, it didn't bring perfection, did it? So therefore, another priesthood after the order of Melchizedek, one that would abide forever, was brought forth through Christ. Verse 12 says, For the priesthood being changed, there is made necessity of a change also of the law. I don't think this refers to the moral aspect of the law, but certainly to the ceremonial aspects of it, the law was changed. Christ completely fulfilling it 
In other places, it says abolished it in his flesh. I don't know how the people who say we need to keep all that get around stuff like this first. The priesthood's changed. We're not under Levitical priesthood anymore. We're under the priesthood of Christ. So therefore, the law had to be changed in Christ. Not, you know, not that it's sin is not sin anymore, but the sacrifices were all fulfilled in Christ, as we've been showing all throughout this class. Verse thirteen says, "For he of whom these things are spoken." pertaining to another tribe of which no man gave attendance at the altar. I mentioned earlier, Christ was not a Levite. He was of the tribe of Judah, fleshly speaking. He was both Mary and Joseph were of that tribe. But they were not given the priesthood, were they? In fact, the only... You'll find one, uh, King Uzziah, he was a the tribe of Judah and he tried to go offer incense mm-hmm. and he got punished for that mm-hmm. verse 14 says for it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood but, but yet he would become our great high priest mm-hmm. he would become really the perfect fulfillment of all That was in the Levitical law. Let's go on to verse 15. Here it says, And it is yet far more evident, it's even more clear, he says, that for that after the similitude of Melchizedek there arises another priest who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of endless life. For he testifies, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. For there is verily a disannulling of the commandments, going before the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. For the law made nothing perfect, but bringing, or the, the bringing in of a better hope did, by the which we draw nigh unto God. <laughs> he says it's even more clear that another priesthood would arise, and that is after the order of Melchizedek, one that is eternal. As it says here, it was not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the law of an endless life. Mm-hmm. In Christ, we have an endless life, don't we? Mm-hmm. You know, there's no longer these cleanliness laws where we got to clean ourselves up and we got to go offer this sacrifice and that sacrifice. Right. Yet Christ did it all, and yet in Him we have endless life. Right. The Old Testament or the Levitical law, if you will, it could not bring that. Again, verse 17, as, as we saw earlier from Psalms, that thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. It says, For there is verily a disannulling of the commandment going before the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. We read last week how the, the law was weak through the flesh. Mm-hmm. The law required perfect obedience, and yet no man but Christ has ever done that. The law itself was not bad, but it showed us how bad we were. (laughs) Yet Christ fulfilled all that for us so that we would not have to. That doesn't give us a free pardon to sin. Yet we have been pardoned from sin through Christ. It says he disannulled it here. He means he set it aside. He canceled these commandments that were weak and unprofitable the law made nothing perfect but bring, the bringing in of better hope did Amen. and the law couldn't make anything perfect because it, nothing could keep it and really you'd have to be perfect to keep the law so therefore it wouldn't even make you perfect would it but yet Christ makes us perfect the, the bringing in of a better hope that is Christ and his priesthood Hebrews 6.19 tells us we have a hope that is steadfast and sure now by the which we draw nigh unto God Ephesians 2.13 tells us that we are made nigh by the blood of Christ in Christ we are made nigh to God before we were far off 
before we were without hope, but yet now we have great hope in Christ. You know, they, the Old Testament saints had a hope that Christ would come. I think they had to have faith that Christ would come. Just the same, we have hope. Not only that Christ, really, we already know that Christ has came, but we have a hope that He is coming again. I want to skip over chapter 8, but I do want to make note that the first seven verses there tell us that Christ is on the right hand of God and that he's offered our sacrifice in the true tabernacle, which is in heaven. And it tells us that the first covenant was not faultless, but the new covenant was established on better promises. Mm-hmm. For time's sake, we'll go on to chapter 9, verse 11. Here it says, But Christ being or being come a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of bulls and, or goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. The first ten verses here are talking about the priesthood of the Old Testament and how they it describes the sacrifices and the tabernacle, how the priest entered in once every year to offer for the people and for himself. Right. Yet Christ, as he says here, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. Mm-hmm. You know, either referring to himself or to the figurative, if you will, tabernacle in heaven. It's not made by hands. It's not the one that Moses was commanded to build and they carried around the wilderness. It's even greater than the temple which Herod built. It's even greater than Solomon's temple. It says, Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once in the holy place, having attained eternal redemption for us. This is the one of my favorite verses for particular redemption. Yeah. That he obtained eternal re- redemption for us. Mm-hmm. He didn't make it possible, but it says he obtained it. He literally right. went in there and got it for us, if you will. Yeah. And it's not just for anybody. He says it's for us. Mm-hmm. But the blood of bulls and goats are as Goats and calves that are called here, they could not take away sin, but his own blood did. Verse 13, he says, For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctify it to the puring of the flesh, or purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? You know, the Old Testament sacrifices, they they purified, in a sense, the flesh. They covered for the sins of the flesh, but that's all they could do is cover them up for the time. Mm-hmm. How much more shall the blood of Christ, though he says, how much better shall his blood cleanse us, not just outwardly, but inwardly as well? Mm-hmm. That we may serve the living God, he says. You know, Christ... His blood, his sacrifice, if you will, purchased us forever. As it said back there in verse 12, he obtained eternal redemption for us. Mm-hmm. You know, it wasn't a temporary redemption, but it was. Right. it's for all of eternity. You know, there's so many rabbit holes we could get off on that probably. Mm-hmm. But how that it was eternal salvation we saw earlier. Here he calls it re- eternal redemption. Seeing that Christ has done all this for us, there's no doubt that we cannot lose it. Right. To say that we could somehow lose our salvation would entail that Christ had somehow failed. Right. No, he obtained eternal redemption for us. He, even greater than the Old Testament, Sacrifices, he will purge our conscience from dead works to serve the living God, he says. 
Just in every way, Christ is better. <laughs> Let's skip down to verse 22. It says, And all, almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without the shedding of blood is no remission. Amen. God always requires blood to cover sin. Mm -hmm. And we see this all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, mm -hmm. when he made the sacrifice and made the skin of the coats of skin for Adam and Eve. All throughout the law, it was blood that covered. But Christ's blood was perfect blood, wasn't it? Right. It says, verse 23, It was therefore necessary that the pattern of things in heaven should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. You know, the, whole, the law was a pattern of things to come, a pattern of things in heaven, it says. But Christ, by a better sacrifice, offered up himself. <laughs> the blood of bulls and goats was not sufficient to take away sin. <laughs> Verse 24 says, For Christ is not entered in the holy place made with hands, which are the figure of the true, but in the heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Christ has made sacrifice on our behalf in the presence of God. The Holy of Holies in the tabernacle was a type of that presence of God, but Christ went into the holy place where God himself is. Continue on to verse 25 here. It says, Nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with the blood of others. As we saw, as Leviticus 16 instructs them to, on the Day of Atonement to offer sins for themselves and for the people. Right. And at other times, other sacrifices were made as well. But year after year, these sacrifices were made, but not the sacrifice of Christ. Verse 26 says, For then must he have often suffered since the foundation of the world, but now once in the end of the world... Hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself? You know, if Christ had to die every time we sinned, he'd be dying over and over again, wouldn't he? Right. You know, all the way back to Adam and Eve, all the way to present day, he would have to offer himself again and again. And it says, but now once he hath appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. He put away sin. That really means he abolished it. He canceled it, if you will, by his sacrifice. <clears throat> we don't need to crucify him afresh, as the scriptures say. Right. No. No. Right. Well, that's one reason why I don't like the uh, Roman Catholic picturing of supposed Christ on the cross. Right. You know, we have a pretty clear picture I think in Moses smiting the rock the second time mm -hmm. that was not pleasing to God right. in fact in doing so he wasn't able to see the promised land right. verse 27 says it is appointed unto men once to die but after this the judgment we can be sure unless Christ returns in our lives that we will expire if you will mm -hmm. that this flesh will cease to take its last breath and will be buried in the ground or whatever method the, whoever's left with your body does with it. Mm -hmm. But after this judgment, we can be sure all of us will stand before God one day. Mm -hmm. you know, no matter your view on the judgments and if there's more than one, if there's one, we will stand before God and give an account for the deeds done in this body. Right. You know, the lost, it said, they will stand before God be judged by their works, and all that are not found written in the Lamb's Book of Life shall be cast in the lake of fire. Right. Verse 28 says, For Christ once offered to bear the sins of many, or was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Mm -hmm. well, as we've already said, he was offered once for our sins. Sure. But he's coming again one day with... He won't be coming as a sacrifice for sin. He'll be coming as the king of kings. Destroying all the enemies and ruling with that rod of iron. 
Revelation 19, I think, describes that coming when he takes the throne, if you will. That's the coming we should be looking for. Right. Thanks be God that he came and he sacrificed for sin. Right. Thanks be to God that he's coming again as King of kings and Lord of lords. Right. Let's go over to chapter 10, verse 1. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they have for then they excuse me, for then would they have not ceased to be offered, because that the worshippers once purged should have no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. As we've pointed out, they offered these sacrifices year after year continually because they couldn't make the offer perfect, could they? You know, if they could, they would have ceased from sin. That is the difference with Christ's sacrifice. He makes us perfect. Therefore, we don't need to be offered again and again. You know, there is no such thing as penitence as the Roman Catholics teach. You're not going to appease God for your sins. Mm -hmm. That's their teaching of purgatory, that people go there to be cleansed from their sins before they can go to heaven. Mm -hmm. Oh, if you're, if Christ has sacrificed, sacrificed himself for you, you've been made perfect. Right. Not that we could ever truly do anything in this flesh to appease God of sin anyway. But it says those sacrifices there is a remembrance again of sins every year. Every year they had to they remember they had sin and they had to go back to it mm -hmm. and do it again. Certainly we ought to confess sin before God. Christ doesn't have to come and die for us again. Right. We don't have to the sins that Christ has died for have been removed as far as the east is from the west. Good. We don't have to do something to make up for them, if you will. <laughs> for it's not possible, verse 4, that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Well, I guess in this sense, the blood of Christ was special, if you will. Mm -hmm. But I think the blood of bulls and goats, the problem with them, they were tainted by sin, just like everything else, weren't they? Mm -hmm. The whole of creation has been tainted by sin. Right. Yet Christ's blood was perfect. That's why it could go to the tabernacle in heaven and be sacrificed for us. Mm -hmm. That's why he could put it on the mercy seat before God himself. I don't know that Christ's blood was necessarily magical, if you will. I don't know there's probably a better word for that, but it was perfect blood. Mm -hmm. Have you ever tried to use a dirty rag to clean up um, dirt? It only does so good, doesn't it? Right. You know, when I change oil in my cars, I usually have a a dirty rag to try to wipe off the oil. It doesn't take it all off. That's right. kind of how the Old Testament sacrifices were. They could cover it a little bit. They could clean up a little bit, but they could not take it away forever. Right. You can't cleanse sin with that which is tainted by sin. And that is one of the problems with works-based salvation. Mm -hmm. So all your righteousness are as filthy rags, as Isaiah says. Even your good works in their flesh are tainted by sin. Mm -hmm. Let's go on to verse 5 here. It says, Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, you know, these verse, this verse through verse 7 is quoting from Psalms 40, verse 6 through 8. Come into the world, he say, a sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body thou hast prepared for me. And burnt offering the sacrifice for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book that is written to me, to do thy will, O God. Amen. God was, he accepted the sacrifices. They were well pleasing unto him in a sense, but yet, Christ's sacrifice is the only one that's said that it satisfied him. <laughs> he 
he was okay, if you will, with accepting sacrifice for sin, or sacrifice for sin. But what he desired was perfect obedience. Mm-hmm. In fact, isn't that what Samuel told Saul? First Samuel fifteen twenty two. It's better to hearken than the fat of rams. Mm-hmm. You know, Saul. He, I think that's where he had kept some of the sheep. And they, Samuel came down and said, "Well, did you do like I told you to?" Mm-hmm. Yeah, we got rid of it all. <laughs> and what's the bleeding of the sheep and the lowing of the oxen? I hear. Right. Of course, Saul made an excuse and said, "Oh, the, the people they made me do it. Mm-hmm. Well, they thought they could make sacrifices for God. The sacrifices were good, but God wanted obedience. <laughs> you know our." Today our good works are good and we ought to do them, but yet if they're without obedience to God, they're really not pleasing to Him. <laughs> and that is the difference with Christ. He was the perfect obedience. He was you know, to the law, to the will of God, everything, He was perfect. Mm-hmm. That's why it says here, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God, verse 7. It says in the volume of the book it is written to me. The whole Old Testament pointed to Christ coming, mm-hmm. and yet the Jews couldn't even see him for who he was. In verse 8, it goes on to say, And when he, above when he had said, Sacrifice and offering, and burnt offerings, and offerings for sin thou wouldest not, neither had pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. Christ came to take away these sacrifices. Mm-hmm. We saw they were the the burnt offering, the meat offering, the peace offering, the sin offering, the trespass offering. And there were others as well that went along with that, the drink offering. That he may establish a better covenant, as he says here. Verse ten, by the which we are all sanctified through the by the which will we are all sanctified through the offering of of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. You know, we are sanctified by Christ, set apart, made holy, if you will. First Corinthians one thirty says he is our sanctification. Right. You know, in the sight of God we have been sanctified, we have been made righteous, we have really we are perfect, we are complete in him. Mm-hmm. Yes, I realize as we walk through this life we need to be sanctified as well mm-hmm. Christ came and he says here to take away the first that he may establish the second mm-hmm. in Christ there is a new covenant right. a better covenant if you will mm-hmm. let's go on to verse 11 here it says and every high priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifice which can never take away sins but this man speaking of Christ mm-hmm. after he had offered once or one sacrifice for sins forever sat down on the right hand of God from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool for by one offering he hath made perfect or hath perfected forever them that are sanctified <laughs> as we said the old testament priests they offered over and over again the sacrifices but Christ by one offering one sacrifice he says he sacrificed for sins forever throughout all of eternity we won't have to worry about sacrifice for sins anymore for just in one in one day if you will in one sacrifice he fulfilled all of it and it says he sat down on the right hand of God we know he's there on the right hand of God. Stephen testifies to that in Acts chapter 7. It says, From henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. 1 Corinthians 15, 25 through 27 tells us that Christ will reign till all his enemies are under his feet. And the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. I think that's fulfilled at the great white throne when he says death and hell are cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. From then on, there will be no more death, will there? <laughs> but 
by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. In Christ we have been made perfect. We have been made complete, if you will. Right. Colossians 2, 10 says we are complete in him. And forever, that's forever. Not just for a little while, not just until we mess up. If it has some teach that it was left up to us to keep it, we would have messed up the very first day we are saved. Right. But Christ perfected us. What Christ does, he doesn't do halfway. Right. Let's go on to verse 15. It says, Whereof of the Holy Ghost also is wit a witness to us. For after that he had said before, and here is this new covenant which is based on Jeremiah 31 33 this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days saith the Lord I will put my laws in their hearts and in their minds will I write them and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more now where remission of these is there is no more offering for sin Amen. God says he puts his law in our hearts and our minds we ought to thank God that we have his word to tell us what his will is, tell us what his standards are, if you will. But yet, the Holy Ghost will guide us in all truth, the scripture says. I don't think it's up to man to decide what is right and wrong. Right. But if we've been saved, the Holy Spirit will tell us what is right and wrong. The Holy Spirit will convict us, and God will chastise us, Hebrews 12 tells us. But I really like verse 17. Their sins and iniquities will I remember no more Amen. it's all been removed from our account if you will every every last sin every last transgression now where there where remission of these is there is no more offering for sin Christ doesn't need to be offered anymore if our sins have been remitted if our sins have been forgiven pardoned cancelled if you will remission Kind of carries the idea of going back, doesn't it? <laughs> that our sins have been removed or rolled back. When cancer is in remission, it's no longer growing anymore. In fact, it's going the other way. And so is sin in our lives if we've truly been born again. Now, I don't think we'll ever reach sinless perfection in this flesh. But yet if we don't come to the point where we say, as Paul O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I don't right. know that we ever have a truly right understanding of what sin is. I always like what Pink said on this. That it was not the absence of sin, but the grieving over it which separates empty professors from the children of God. Mm -hmm. We're definitely not absent of sin, but oh how we ought to grieve over it. Oh how it ought to we ought not to be content with sin. Right. No, if Christ has remitted our sins, there is no need for sacrifice anymore. <laughs> there's no need for penance. There's no need for purgatory. There's no need for you doing good works to maintain your salvation. Christ has perfected us. I want to look at one more place and we'll close. Chapter 13, verses 10 through 13. This just shows us once again how the Christ fulfilled every aspect of the sacrifices in the Old Testament. Hebrews 13 verses 10 through 13 say, We have an altar whereof they have no right to eat which serve the tabernacle. This altar seems to refer to Christ and his sacrifice, which they who still serve the law of the, the Old Testament covenant if you will they have no right to eat of it it says no right to be partakers of it we don't literally eat the body of Christ but we do in type it's for the bodies of those beasts verse 11 whose blood is brought into sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp mm -hmm. as we saw in Leviticus 4 among other places with the sin offering the, the blood was brought in but the rest of it was taken out and burnt without the camp it said outside the camp and sin was always dealt with outside of the camp notice verse 12 it says wherefore Jesus also that he might sanctify the people with his own blood suffered without the gate 
outside the city, if you will, out which really fulfilled without the camp. Christ suffered. Christ died there on Calvary, mm -hmm. which was on the north side of Jerusalem, some direction, which was also a requirement for the burnt offering that they be slain in the north side of the altar. So was Christ crucified outside the camp for our sins. Verse 13 says, let us, there, or let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. And we must go to him without anything else. So without the camp here, without the world, without really our, even our good works, without anything but just simply looking to him. It says bearing his reproach. Bearing his rejection, if you will. Psalms 22, 6 tells us that he was rejected of men. He was reject, a rejected person in the flesh, but yet well, we ought to be willing to bear the same thing. Mm -hmm. you know, Hebrews 11 tells us that Moses saw that it was better to bear the approach of Christ. He said there was greater riches than all the treasure in, in Egypt. Christ might not be highly esteemed among men, but yet he is the perfect sacrifice for our sins. I guess that will bring us to a close for the night. Our next lesson will be our final lesson. We'll do a review and I hope to put a, a diagram of some sort together to try to show you how all this is fulfilled in Christ. Mm -hmm. We may look at a few verses in Acts as well, as I said. Any comments or questions before we close? Well, I like to, I just saw a couple of things. Um, and I think it was Hebrews 9.28, it said for many, not for all. And uh, we see particular redemption there. And this, and this is just a question. Does the devil really have the ability to kill? I wondered that, but Christ did say, Fear not them that kill the body, but... Fear him which after he has killed you hath power right. to cast in the hill. But he also had to give the devil permission to go so far as his life. Right? Job. He kind of got the just being destroyed. Right. I'd say he can do those things if with God. Permission. If, if, yeah, if it's part of the will of God for him to do so. I don't know. I know. So I'm just curious <laughs> he was seen Judas. Who was Judas? He left. I well, just like man has the ability to kill other men, right? And kill themselves, right? And I kind of wondered what he what was meant exactly there by the power of death. But in a sense, he slew the whole human race spiritually. Right. But like I said, Re Revelation one eighteen, I believe, it was mm -hmm. Christ says he has the keys of hell and of death mm -hmm. so, apparently at least now Satan can't do it without Christ giving him permission <laughs> I don't think Satan has ever been able to do anything outside the permission of God if you will but mm -hmm. certainly Satan has more power than we sometimes give him credit for it Anything else? All right. Well, then we'll see you next week for the last week.